most of our research is on trained individuals. And when we finish a study, more than three quarters of them will say that it was the hardest they've ever trained in their lives. They just don't, most people do not go to failure. Hey guys, Dr. Mike here for RP Strength. I'm here with Dr. Brad Schoenfeld, professor and the world's ranking expert on muscle hypertrophy research. Brad? Mike? Wow. Sounds like the, uh, the dialogue in John Wick, where they just look at each other and they're like, <laughs> John? Um, relative effort is a term that I love and a term that I learned from you. And it's an excellent term, but people don't know it. What is relative effort? Yeah, so in simple terms, it's the force exerted during a given exercise relative to the total muscle producing, force producing capacity of the muscle. So how much force can a muscle produce versus how much effort actually was expended? There are a couple of proxies for it. RPE, we won't get into it's an okay proxy. Really adopted from strength sports, which itself adopted right. from endurance testing. RIR, reps in reserve. What is it and do you consider it a decent functional proxy for relative effort? Yeah, so uh, reps in reserve is a metric by which somewhat it's the perceived proximity to failure. So an RIR of zero would mean that you feel you cannot get another repetition at the given load. Uh, an RIR of one would mean that you think you could have gotten one more, but not two more reps, et cetera. And uh, yeah, I, I do think it is a good proxy because it, it really exemplifies the definition that you are, if an RIR of zero is max effort, the maximal force producing capacity of the muscle, uh, a sub uh, max RIR would be some relative effort uh, mm -hmm. to, to achieve that goal. I typically like to lie to people and anything, even if I fail and the bar crashes on me visibly in public, I like to tell people after I get up and dust myself off that I had two more. Do you support that sort of? Uh, I do not. Oh. I'd never lie in my RARs. Excellent. No. Very well. Just me. Um, what has the research shown about the relationship of RIR or relative effort and muscle growth? Is there like a range we want to target? Is there uh, an unequivocal, this is too low of an RIR or too high? Tell us a story about that, Brad. Yeah, so full disclosure, uh, I come from my, my beginnings were as a true bro, where uh, I was the go, uh, go all out or go home. Same. So I would do every set to failure, many uh, sets with forced repetitions or drop sets. So it was all about going beyond, quote unquote, beyond failure. Mm -hmm. And uh, somewhat to my surprise, um, the literature does not show that. And I've uh, really done a, I don't want to say a 180, but certainly a, a 90, a 90 <laughs> um, over time in terms of my view on this. Uh, and that we've, we carried out a meta analysis on this topic, and there's been a couple others now, that do not show uh, failure, going to all out failure is necessary for maximizing growth. And um, the general consensus is somewhere around a two, again, we don't have, Trying to quantify an exact RIR gets very difficult. But uh, recently, a colleague of mine, Martin Refalo from uh, Australia. A great researcher. Great zone, researcher right? and did a really terrific study on this. It was trained subjects. It was a unilateral design. So he was able to control the lifestyle factors, et cetera. And uh, he showed that for, for legs, for lower body quad uh, growth, no difference between a zero RIR versus a two RIR. Scoop for you, I'm collaborating on a study with a group out of Evascula, uh, University of Evascula in Finland. Shout out to Zhua Homi. Mm -hmm. um, where uh, we had one group training for 10 weeks at a one RIR. The other group did a descending RIR across the study. So the first couple of weeks, it was a four RIR, then it went down to a three, then a two, then a one mm -hmm. in the final couple of weeks. Yeah, that's how we do it at RP, interesting. Some people might be copying you. Well, we paid to the, have the, the results <laughs> biased. I'll just the, be flat out with that. The scoop for you is, um, and this paper's in review now, but I, hopefully that'll get published soon. Um, no, no dip, certainly the uh, one RIR wasn't better. And uh, for the tri, we looked at quads and, and tricep hypertrophy. The, for the triceps, there was a suggestion of a slight, not much, a slight benefit for the uh, descending group. Mm -hmm. So it certainly didn't seem to show negative effects. 
of uh, not training claustrophilia all the time, but uh, it might even show some positive benefits. Right, but it, it's easier because you're not well. Correct. As hard so the, all the, time. the we did RPE too, and the RPE was of course less. Yep. Uh, so it was easier to to carry out. And by the way, that from now for bodybuilders, they'll do it like you, you and myself back in the day. That's my next question. You do it whatever uh, you know is required. But for the general public. Uh, not having a high RPE can be a benefit to adherence, totally, which is really totally. important. And even, I would say, if you're a serious bodybuilder and you're really pushing the limits on everything, sleep, diet, sometimes pharmacology, training as hard as you can, if there's unequivocal results that show that training not as hard can let you have the same gains, you'd have to be real weird not to try that right, because right. it's like you can at least do your routine for longer and have more time before you need to deload. Right. In any case, a really funny story about... Uh, Martin Ruffalo is he, um, his Instagram, and you guys should absolutely follow him, is MR Fitness. It stands for Martin Ruffalo Fitness, but everyone thinks Mr. it stands Fitness. for Mr. Fitness, and he'll always try to correct you. I'm like, no, nah, you know what? It's Mr. Fitness. <laughs> so go follow Mr. Fitness on Instagram. Next question for you, Brad, is how comfortable are you personally in extrapolating the research on RIR from uh, studies on mostly undergraduates that have lifted for several years, mostly, not wholly, to real world people of two kinds at least. One is folks that are just trying to get in the gym and build some fucking muscle so their wives look at them again for the love of God. Just notice that I'm here, please, anyone, wife, anyone. The other group is bodybuilders serious about gains. Is there a difference in extrapolation? Are you like more lukewarm about telling bodybuilders to stay away from failure or even more insistent upon it? Um, for example, one of my friends, Broderick Chavez, who coaches bodybuilders, is on record saying training to failure is one of the stupidest ways to train, especially for bodybuilders, because the amount of stress response you get out of it is insanely high compared to the roughly the same gains you get from two or three reps in reserve. And stress over time is the great killer of physiques, in his opinion. Um, that's an interesting take. I tend to agree with that. But what, what do you think? Are you okay just looking at the studies and going right to the real world? Or do we need to be a bit more nuanced about it? I think that's a very fair point. So look, the studies that we have, have certainly have some limitations. Now, Refero's study was in pretty well-trained mm -hmm. individuals. Now, they weren't high-level bodybuilders. But they were Australian. So are they really people? That's true. And our study, uh, the study I mentioned in Finland, you could kind of say the same thing. Well, but the they, Finns they are were, just, they're just better. They were, they were trained individuals, but again, not high-level bodybuilders. So how can you extrapolate that? And particularly, these are natural athletes. They're not natural lifters. Like me. They're not on gear. Like you, yes. Uh, they're not on gear. So could that throw a caveat into it? Look, um, to the point of the individual you mentioned, I would kind of push back on that to some extent in saying that you can't think of failure, and, and this is another, by the way, another limitation with the literature, is that they've looked at multiple sets uh, studies, all sets to failure versus no sets to failure, and it's not a dichotomous option, not necessarily. You don't have to do all sets, like I used to do, all sets had to be to failure. That's not a necessity that you have to do. So what I would say is, is that I still think, hold out the possibility. I'm not saying it's so, but we'd have to carry out a study in bodybuilders and good luck with that. Uh, are you volunteering to do a can routine? I uh, have my own thing to do. <laughs> but you could say that, look, uh, going to failure is another way to progressively overload, to push someone beyond their present capacity. And in a very highly trained lifter, you want to try to potentially use all the tools you have. Uh, could just selective use of failure training. I, I certainly think it's true that going to failure on all sets is counterproductive. Mm -hmm. um, but do I still hold out the prospect of possibility that some failure training may be uh, effective or, or an effective strategy to generate somewhat greater gains yes. in very high level individuals? I think there's a rationale for it. Yeah. And I don't think really there's a negative. I, I don't think that's going to kill your gait. Like the inroading into your fatigue when you're doing, let's say, last set to failure on a few select exercises. Yeah, whatever. Here's another thing, though, Mike, that's important that, again, I think gets lost sometimes. It is also somewhat exercise dependent. So going to failure yes. on a squat is a lot different than going to failure on a leg extension or on a lateral raise. Yeah. I don't know. You've never seen me wrist curl to failure. Well, that's true. Chaos. 
I do not know many people like they finish a set of lateral raises and it's like they fall on the floor. I'm crushed. Sure. You know, and I, but you do a set of squats to failure. I mean, you're, you're winded. The systemic so, demand is much higher. Correct. Mm -hmm. So I, I think these are all nuances that we have to tease out of the literature and they're just not well, at this point, in my opinion, delineated to make uh, good, con to draw good conclusions. Yes. I think on an overall, uh, from an overall standpoint, from a general standpoint, we can say that Failure training is certainly overrated that for the most part, you don't need to go to failure and certainly you don't need to do it on all sets. Yep. I think that's, I'm quite confident in that conclusion. Sure. But to say you never need to train to failure is it, I think that is somewhat equivalent. And to add to that too, we're talking hypertrophy, there actually is a negative effect, uh, certainly on doing all sets to failure for strength. So if your goal is strength, which I know you're a big power lifter, um, I was never, I'm never big and I was a terrible power lifter, but thank you, Brad. I got to give you props. Oh, so, thank you so much. So, but anyway, but if you're interested in strength, that uh, failure training actually be, can be counterproductive. Yeah. And it's also kind of strange to be getting weaker for reps in your program and convince yourself you're actually getting bigger. It, it's a bit of a, 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 the technical term I think is mind fuck. Um, Brad, if I choose to go to failure all the time, which I totally get, like there's a spirit energy thing, you know, like. Your fucking wife yells at you before you leave for fucking house. You go to work, your fucking boss yells at you. On the way, you know, to the gym, people in traffic yell at you. You get to the gym, you just want war and you're everything to failure for the soul. If I just love going to failure, are there any ways you would recommend that I can adjust some other elements of my program to make sure I'm not like um, not able to survive the program all the way through? Get the most out of, okay, I'm going to failure and everything. Do I reduce my volume? Do I choose certain exercises over others? I have to go to failure. That's my number one rule. Everything else I'm willing to be iffy about. What, what, do you have any recommendations about how to change things up to accommodate my strange request? Yeah, so I mean, you, you know, it's a real hypothetical because I'm, you know, that, if you had to do, I'm not sure why I would never recommend doing that, but let's, people do go, it. let's go with Millions your hypothetical yeah. <laughs> that you just need to, I don't think reducing volume is the answer because the volume studies that we have generally are all sets to failure. So there's going to be issues with maximizing that volume, but cutting the volume, I don't think if your goal is maximal growth would necessarily be the right strategy. I would think per, perhaps in giving this some general thought, um, would, uh, having it on less complex exercise. So not doing your squats, your rows, so focus, or let's say dumbbell, barbell yeah, rows. Yeah, yeah. So focusing more on your machine type work on single joint exercises would probably be the strategy that I would go with there, which are less, as you said, systemically demanding. Sure, okay, that makes perfect sense. Um, a lot of the pushback we get, and some of it is very well intended on the training to failure research or RIR research is that people say, look, look, people can't estimate RIR anyway, so why even bother? What do you say to that? Yes, yeah, so I'll give you two different answers to that. Number one, uh, untrained individuals, definitely true. They cannot uh, estimate RIR well. You have to be able to, you have to have trained to failure pretty consistently for a given period of time to understand what it's like. And it is even exercise uh, dependent that certain exercises if you're like on going to failure on squats is different than going to failure on leg extensions mm -hmm. again. So being able to estimate your proximity to failure is somewhat different. But, and also even with most trained individuals, quote unquote trained individuals, when we, we most of our research is on trained individuals. And when we finish a study, more than three quarters of them will say that it was the hardest they've ever trained in their lives. They just don't, most people do not go to failure. So they're going to have difficulty in terms of, getting a proximity to failure, which by the way is why in general in our studies, we choose to have everyone train to failure because trying to teach them- Standardization. Yes, yeah, it's just easier to standardize in that way. It's something we can control better. But if you teach people, uh, train lifters, generally they do quite well. In the study that I just mentioned to you uh, that I'm collaborating with Vascula, um, we, we had an acclimation uh, week where we, taught them, first of all, we had them go to failure on the sets and then taught them how to do the RAR. W within the acclimation period, a short period of time, they were able to generally get within one uh, rep oh, wow. in terms of estimation. And even better, we actually reassessed them after the 10-week period and they improved in the bench press. They were almost exact 
in their ability to. Uh, wow. So and that's just in 10 weeks. In 10 weeks. Very serious yeah. thought about so, am so I, I going to fail? I think people's, uh, the thought, now again, as I mentioned, if it's just someone coming in out of the gym and saying, hey, give me your IR, RIR, I think there are issues. But as someone who is trained in this, and obviously in studies, you're hopefully going to be doing that, you're going to be teaching them properly. I think we can extrapolate pretty well from the research that we have. Excellent. That makes a ton of sense. I'm glad my iPhone keeps turning off. It's really pleasant. Um, is there any evidence at all, or would you be willing to speculate, and granted it, we announce it as speculation, that there are individual differences between people in um, RIR response? Like, are there people out there who, for them, two and three RIR are just the bee's knees and going all the way to failure just wrecks them? Or are there other people who just don't get as much out of two or three RIR, and when they go to failure, they just get notably better results? Is that evident in the research at all, or N not from the research? You know, I've uh, I've not been able to ext extrapolate that from the research in any of the studies that have been carried out, and I don't recall any that have specifically tried to look at individualized responses. But certainly, there's a logical base to that, Mike. That um, if you are going to failure, I mean, your various lifestyle factors have to enter into that. So we, again, without any research, we, uh, we downgrade to the next level of evidence, which would be logical rationale. And um, I, I mean, your sleep, your stress level, your nutritional status, um, all of those things are going to be uh, go into play. Uh, by the way, another thing I think is important to point out where individual differences may come in is in age. That uh, as people get older, they have less recovery ability. And of course, you talked about that. Uh, Why did you point to me when you said when people get older? I don't, I don't want to you know, go down that road. <laughs> um, but seriously, hey. um, in all seriousness, if your recovery, if uh, you're going to have inroading into your recovery from a lot of failure training, even some. So it, at least conceivably, uh, as people get older, and there's really not good research in older individuals. Sure, sure. Dr. Schoenfeld, that was incredibly elucidating, as you science people like to say at the end of your abstracts. And uh, thank you so much for being on the channel, folks. I've been Dr. Mike. Go out into the world and fail a lot. That was weird. See you next time.